most of these people are known very well to all of you, but uh, Karen Markidis is president and CEO of Chalmers University of Technology. Roger Kornberg, as Birita said, is the 2006 Nobel Laureate in Chemistry for his work on RNA uh, polymerases and is um, a professor at Stanford University. Mene Pangalos is, of course, Executive VP for Innovative Medicines and Early Development. And Richard Neutzer is a physicist and structural biologist who is a professor at the University of Gothenburg. And I think we've assembled a wonderfully diverse group of people to discuss the topic. Now, the, the program for this afternoon is that we have 75 minutes, and my role is very minimal. I simply am here really to try and spark a conversation between these four panelists. And every so often, I will reach out to the audience and invite comments and questions um, from you all. And this topic of how to create an innovative environment probably conjures up rather different pictures in all of our minds. And later, I think it will be interesting to get some views from the audience on what they think an innovative environment is. But I thought we might start by just asking our panelists to very briefly um, outline what comes to mind for them when they hear the phrase, an innovative environment. And perhaps we could start with you, Roger. What comes to mind? <laughs> <laughs> well, there are a number of elements that spring to mind, uh, which unavoidably draw on my own experience. And I'm sure others will have something to say which differs uh, in some respect because uh, innovation itself cannot be replicated, uh, but takes uh, different forms and different shapes in different people's lives and places. Uh, in my case, uh, the first thing that comes to mind is risk taking. Uh, I don't think it's possible for anyone to be innovative anywhere without taking a chance. Uh, so certainly an environment that supports that and encourages it is absolutely necessary. Uh, another thought which uh, this immediately conjures up uh, is the element of time. I mean, one has to feel that there is no limitation of time. It's something in the career of a scientist, uh, such as myself and many of you, happens only once, and that's probably in graduate school when the time horizon is very long, and young people in general don't have a time horizon anyway. Uh, so I, I can recall vividly uh, at that age, not even thinking time was a commodity. It was never an element, uh, never a factor in my consideration. Uh, beyond that, looking to really the environment itself, I think it does make a difference uh, to be in a place where there are uh, innovative people or people who have themselves been willing to take chances and support this kind of endeavor, uh, who are at the very least, illustrative of what it entails. In my own case, uh, I was in an environment, I had uh, advisors or mentors uh, who were interested in taking the largest steps possible and would be supportive of someone who tried to do so. But I looked to them uh, as examples. I looked to them for guidance and support. That's clearly an essential component. And. Uh, the, perhaps the, the last thing I might mention is the necessity of a suitable peer group. I mean, you, you can't be alone, completely alone in this. Uh, you have to feel that the people around you understand and are supportive, or, or at least it's extremely helpful. Uh, at the very least, uh, they'll be sounding boards and they will provide criticism. Uh, because most of our ideas, or certainly most of mine, are wrong. Uh, and most of the things I get excited about turn out to be uh, embarrassing the next day. I mean, one night I have a fantastic idea. I go to bed thinking I have <laughs> solved the problem of the universe, and the next morning I can't figure out <laughs> what I was eating or drinking the night before. <laughs> so uh, without doubt, having people around you who are appropriately sober and critical and can help you maintain a grip on reality <laughs> That makes a big difference, too. I think I've gone on long enough, Adam. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you, as moderator, should have cut me off a no, long no, time ago. <laughs> that, was, that was the first time they heard you speak, so you could get longer that time. But next time, you won't get I should, mention that, I should mention there are three free seats down the front, which are not going to be occupied again. So if, any, if three people want to step down and get some seats, they're, they're available. Richard. OK, that's a brilliant answer, Roger. Um, I also come from the academic environment. Um, at obviously at a, a somewhat earlier stage 
in, in my career development and group development, but I certainly I think about a, an innovative environment as, as an environment where there's a group of people who have a, a common idea, a common theme, based on or the search for an understanding of a common problem. And I absolutely agree that the willingness to take risk and take a chance and the willingness to simply be wrong is a critical part of, of an innovative environment. Um, I, I don't think an innovative environment has to be particularly big. Some of the most innovative scientists and most successful scientists in the world have, have very small groups. And one thing which I certainly have benefited from in, in my career, and I think is true for many, many people, is this ability to collaborate, collaborate outside the group, collaborate across different disciplines. In Sweden, collaborating very internationally is a critical part of, of being able to be part of something much bigger than, than what you have in your immediate environment, as well as, as a search for an understanding of a common problem. OK, thank you. Karen. Mm -hmm. um, yes, my background is I'm also a um, scientist, in chemist, actually. And I've been, um, uh, when I was uh, a professor in chemistry, I saw that from uh, both the uh, United States and Swedish perspective. And so I really have um, been thinking a lot about these questions. Um, then, and I was happy enough that I could try to be part of solving uh, these environments, to set, set the scene and, and uh, the incentives uh, as a leader of a university. But of course, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't open up it, it to make it easy. Uh, but I can, I can say that there are some certain things that I can also compare um, in between the cultures in, in the two countries and uh, that could be of importance. And of course, it's very important to, so how do we bring out creativity? It has a lot to do how we are brought up in school and how the school system is fostering us. So it's very different in, in different cultures. And you have to kind of be in, in touch with that. And I think to bring out also um, uh, to, so that you, if, it's, if, you, if you are uh, brave or naive, it doesn't ma really matter, I, don't, I think. But it, so that you are actually doing things beyond and go across borders in different directions. Uh, and then if you have an environment around you that is somehow uh, somebody has thought about that it's kind of connected so that you don't uh, isolate yourself or you don't get uh, lost. So that there is a kind of a support system. And this is what I try to work with to see if could we improve this support system. Shouldn't be forcing anything. It should bring out the creativity or design thinking, as you say, in Stanford. Thank you very much indeed. And many, last time. So it's good going last, because you get time to scribble a few more things, so, just, so it's not very well rehearsed. Um, I, I think much of it has been said. I, as I think of what it, what it means to, to, to myself or potentially AstraZeneca, I think about the people. So obviously surrounding yourself with, 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 with bright people of different disciplines. And I think one of the beauties of being in a company is we're, we're very multicultural, both in terms of where people come from, so educated from different countries, different regions, which I, think, which I think brings a different flavor to how people think about solving problems. And I think that's one of the strengths actually of being in Sweden. Um, but also different disciplines, chemistry, physics, medicine, biology, biochemistry, which I think bringing together also enables you to, to tackle problems uh, quite differently and, and, and think about things differently. And then on top of that, even different therapy areas, because an oncologist would look at a problem in oncology very different to someone who works on metabolic disease and sometimes coming at things from a different angle enables you to see problems differently. So that I think is, 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 is one of the things that I, I, I think about, uh, is very important. The next piece is the environment, I think, around the, that you create. And that can be everything from, I think, the, the sort of soft foot, you know, the, the way people get together around their coffee rooms. You know, think about why, why is Boston so successful in other areas. Think about how you, collaborations happen serendipitously, how you help foster interactions between people in your facilities or within the community. And I think about the things we're trying to do with Karolinska or Uppsala or Salgrenska to try, try and foster collaboration between groups. I think that, that, that creates uh, innovation. The more porous you can make yourself, the more amenable you can be to getting ideas from at the outside as well as from within. Mm. I think that really helps. Um, and then finally, um, there's a piece about giving people time. And I think when everyone's incredibly busy, 
you know, we, we sometimes hide behind the excuse of not having enough time to do innovative research or basic research or really to fundamentally understand a problem. But there's something that I think is fundamentally even more important, that's, that's truth-seeking. So challenging dogma, challenging the hypothesis, actually having a hypothesis to test um, and not trying to prove that you're right, but trying to prove almost that you're wrong. Um, to, to, to really go at it and not worry about, you know, is this, am I going against the grain? Am I going to upset somebody by showing that this isn't right or this pathway is wrong? So really having a truth-seeking behavior in, in whatever you do to try and really find the right answer to your problem, I think is really important. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, all of you. I mean, already that paints, I think, a picture of a very broad canvas because we, it, it, it's innovation from the individual, at the individual level, and at the group level, and almost at the societal level. All of these things could be defined as an innovative environment. And those are, and presumably, although I'm sure lots of things are common to those, in, to those different environments, there are, in, each one has its own individual structure required. So perhaps we should start at the level of the individual uh, and grow from there. So, and you mentioned risk-taking, Roger. Say just a little bit more about what you mean by the need to be a risk taker. I could give an example which would amuse you. So uh, my uh, graduate advisor was a chemist, probably known to chemists in the audience, a man by the name of Hardin McConnell, a very fine physical chemist at Stanford. And he uh, was a theoretical chemist, but he was supportive of experimental work. And uh, while not really having done much himself, but there was one thing he felt fairly sure of. And he came into the lab and he said, you know, he said, the important thing is to fail every day. <laughs> uh, and of course, any of us who does science or experimental work in particular appreciates what he meant by that. Uh, and the willingness to fail every day is an important element of risk taking. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't feel you have to succeed, you really have to try. Uh, I remember I used to sit with my father when I worked with him when I was very young, planning experiments. And after a few minutes of planning an experiment, discussing what to do, if I could call it that, he was deciding what to do, and I was supposedly a participant. Uh, and he would say, well, uh, can't sit on our hands, got to go do something. And it didn't matter whether he'd thought it through or whether he felt he had the perfect design, but he would go and do something. Uh, and I think the, 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 the business of trial and error is of great importance. And uh, coming back to what Karen was alluding to, uh, this is a kind of willingness to try things, to experiment, uh, which I think you're right, uh, can be uh, both a skill and a, and a habit or a frame of mind that is acquired early in life. Uh, and I don't even know if you don't teach it early whether you can learn it late. <laughs> On the other hand, I always say it's you know, better late than never. <laughs> Doesn't matter when, people uh, can always uh, improve and, and learn new things, and this kind of approach should be encouraged. Can I agree with that completely? I mean, for the, our, when we do things well, if I think about, just parochially about drug discovery and development, when we do things well, we fail 90% of the time. So that's, it, very that, well. that's when you're doing very well. <laughs> that's, doing, that's doing very well. That's right. It's actually well above average, actually, for doing that. Um, so you kind of have to get comfortable with failure as a scientist and comfortable with risk taking. And you know, I think uh, uh, Bahija, who's, uh, Bahija Jalal, who's one of our um, the vice president of, executive vice president of, of, uh, of Medamine, uses a phrase which I really like, which is for the science to be able to sort of get to grips with failure, dust themselves down, get back up again and start again. I think that's a, it's, I love that phrase and, and, that, and that, that, that kind of what, what that, the image that that brings because that's what we do. That is what we need to do every day. Um, we're going to fail a lot more often than we succeed, but hopefully with every failure we learn and we take a step, then take a step forwards. And so I think getting comfortable with risk, getting comfortable with challenging ourselves, I think is incredibly important. Um, mm -hmm. I think from the individual perspective, it's really interesting to kind of um, to look at it like that, because what are the, the reward system really that we have for an individual, a scientist? Uh, I think it's, um, uh, it's a little bit bothersome that uh, the, um, um, 
the, the ways that uh, scientists get rewarded from, a, say, a national level, independent of country, is not really uh, looking at these kind of um, reward system for really putting yourself in, a, in context with different kind of incentives all the time. Um, uh, I think it more, it's more common in the United States that you as a basic scientist even get a rewarded from going out to be part of a, a business, go into a company for a certain period of time. But that is definitely not uh, common in Sweden, or no, I don't know how it is in Britain. But I think it's, uh, we, and it's very difficult to talk to that political national level and make them change the way of um, uh, culture of how they reward. So, um, so we have to do more uh, as an individual as ourselves to really uh, put ourselves in, in, in utilize the possibilities to really get uh, inspired and, and dare to, to, um, uh, to walk over, over borders. And I think that at the university level, um, leading um, governance of a university level, we can do so much more. And we have tried, we're trying that actually quite a lot here in Gothenburg. Both universities, we work together in this. And, and what we see is that, it, yes, it works. It really works. It's not only that we feel that, uh, that um, we get a, a kind of a support from the scientists that, that try these things, that uh, they really get inspired by it. But we also see that, uh, that we are successful as a university. So I think we should even be more brave in that we can support in different levels, and maybe also for, from the regional level, we can support individuals that is not happening from a more national or European federal level. So. It's interesting what you say about uh, the culture of, of failure. I once heard it remarked that there is, or someone said that it was a, a notable characteristic of the area around Stanford, people call the Silicon Valley, but uh, includes a very wide area, uh, that there was no stigma attached to failure. People could try and fail again and fail again, and they would still find support to build another organization. I, I don't know if you can be a serial failure how long, but, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> but you can fail, and, and people will support you to try again. And that isn't necessarily true every place. But you, but you know, I was part at one, one time, I was a guest professor there in, at, in Stanford. And, um, and we, were start, we were setting up some, uh, some uh, companies and looked for people to be part of the starting up. And I, it was, for me, it was a kind of a culture shock coming from Sweden and being in that environment and see how they selected the people. Because they said, oh, this is a person perfect for this, has everything there, but has never failed. We cannot take him. <laughs> <laughs> and for me, it was really, really, I, I really made me think a lot. And of course, that's... So true. Well, let's just, oh, sorry. You. Oh, I mean, Sweden as a country is rather risk averse. This is something which is very strong in Sweden. And I saw so career development, if you want to have a career development as an academic or an industry, you also have a period between when you have a successful start normally. Most academics have, have had a successful PhD postdoc period. But then there's this period when there is, where you're both extremely strong requirements to be successful which is in conflict with, with risk taking to a certain extent or to a very large extent. And that's also obviously true in industry. Yes. And, um, and then you reach, a, you reach a period when you have got enough behind you when you can begin to engage in almost crazy stuff again. Um, <laughs> and so that, that play and, and how that, that functions and how that functions in the career development is something which isn't exactly hitting the, the hammer, the nail on the head with the hammer. It's a little bit misplaced, I think. I mean, how you reward, it's, it's actually raising, obviously raising a, a very good point, is how you reward it. Because mm. ultimately, again, you, you can fail serially, you can take risks, <laughs> but ultimately you do want something to come out um, as a consequence of learning from your failures and from, and from taking risks. And obviously one way that you get rewarded in universities is, is the publications and, and the amount of grants you can get in for us. Hopefully it's, um, publications and also hopefully you know drug programs that come out but how do you create an environment where actually you encourage risk taking where it's all right to fail but not too many, times. too many times where yeah. you know the failures you know ultimately lead to something that's tangible as an output I think it's really important but, but you um, know I think um, we have to also we cannot change quickly what how the research council is really rewarding so we have to live with what we have but at the same time we can be uh, kind of diversive uh, i think 
what we have done, what we are trying here in Gothenburg, and uh, and. Um, and this could, of course, be developed much further. But uh, we see that if we have, um, if we have the disciplines really, because that's fostered and connected to the research councils, they understand that. And the scientists can show up as really strong in their discipline. And they can continue to get uh, rewarded and get funding from that system. Because otherwise, if, you, if, you, if, you're, not, if you're not part of that system for a few years, you're out. And, and it's really a problem. So we have to have that. And then on, on, in combination with that, we can open up scenes. We call them, at Chalmers, we call them areas of advance, where we kind of support systems that are virtual and have uh, really porous, really open, and, uh, and where we can put incentives and, uh, and, and different parts of society and also some funding from government can be there to support risk taking, to support bridging over and uh, taking over you also other areas and um, making them yours. And I think that is um, meeting students. Um, I think that is a system that we could even further develop between the two universities, I believe, because it's open and also uh, definitely here with AstraZeneca. Hmm. OK, well, let's come back to the, that, that wider picture a little later. But one thing, what, something that's at the heart of the discussion is the, is the degree of risk taking, mm. the, the boldness of the risk taking? Because we're talking about failing, but you can fail at a small scale or you can fail at a very grand scale because the question you're asking is very big. And I suppose that that, in a way, lies at the heart of this innovation question. I mean, everyone's used to failure, even asking questions that are fairly mundane. But how big should the, people, should the question be? <laughs> how big a failure? How big a failure, <laughs> yes. How, how, how much failure should you aim for? I, I think that what people must bear in mind, uh, it doesn't matter where you begin, it matters where you finish. Yeah. And so it, it is impossible even to predict when you begin, when and where you'll finish. Uh, and w the mark of successful people, call them innovators, call them whatever you will, uh, they usually manage to snatch victory from the jaws of defeat at some time or other. Uh, and they do that by modifying or completely changing their goals. Mm. Uh, I don't know this particular example very well, uh, but I was told that uh, Gilead, for example, which is very profitable today, started out to do one thing. It was a miserable failure, and they completely changed their plan. They did something else. That's right. uh, we all know how physicists succeed. Uh, they start trying to solve a problem, and then they make approximations, and then they make more approximations, and finally they simplify the problem uh, to the point where they uh, can, can solve it. See, you know, the, the famous you want to comment? You know, the, the famous story of the man who wanted, uh, who was addicted to betting on horses, and he kept losing. So finally, he went to it. He decided he'd solve the problem with science. And he had a friend who was a biologist and a chemist and a physicist. He went to the biologist. The biologist said, you know, um, well, if I were you, I would uh, definitely wor worry about their nutrition. And if you feed the horses appropriately, they'll win. Um, he didn't think that was going to be helpful. The chemist uh, uh, told him, well, uh, you know, genetic chemistry is a thing you should breed for speed. And uh, he thought he already knew that. And then the physicist never got back to him with an answer. And finally, after quite some time, he got impatient. He asked the physicist, he said, oh, I remember that problem. I could only solve it for the case of the perfectly spherical horse. <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask a question, Roger? You, you must have had times in, in your career when you thought, oh, oh my god, this has failed, and, and this is it. Is that, or, well, or you've never had that problem? I didn't have quite that experience. I had the the problem of colossal failure. Uh, I was telling the group of students earlier, and uh, Adam will recall, that uh, after three years of graduate school, working terribly hard at something which was completely naive, mm. I had absolutely nothing to show for my efforts. Mm. I mean, after three years of the hardest work I've ever done, I had exactly nothing <laughs> to show for my efforts. And uh, as I told the students, uh, I was sitting one afternoon with my father and telling him about what I was doing, and he heard this litany of failure. And after a while, he said, well, aren't you worried? 
And it, the thought had never crossed my mind. I said, I, I thought for a moment, and then I said to him, but, but I'm going to discover something. And being a wise man, he said, that's all that matters. Well, luckily, one day I finally discovered something. <laughs> so that also introduces the concept of time, which you mentioned at the very beginning, that if you're going to take these bold steps, you, you need, need to give it a lot of time. time. Everybody knows that. And that's one of the problems one faces more in industry than in academia, because there is really a different pressure of time. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's OK to do, well, my students have a joke when I tell them it's a six-month project, it's a 20-year project. Uh, but they realize that that's fine, because they have 20 years. They have as long as they want. Um, I'll support them forever. Yeah. Uh, you have to march to a different drummer in industry. You cannot tell your board that you're doing a 20-year project which may or may not be successful, and who knows if it'll have any value. But, but I think you can, do, you can do it if you have connected uh, the strategy. If the strategy goes in the long term, and then you connect to that kind of short-term deliveries, and because then you, could, you can combine this. You're very right. You know, I, when I was trying to do one very large problem, which eventually succeeded, and was probably the main thing I cited for the prize. Aaron Klug, uh, who was a veteran in this field, said to me, well, what matters is interim results. He said, as long as you can get something along the way, you, know, you need just something along the way to show you're still alive and kicking. That's all that I think, and I think you know, balance and risk, I think there are some things that you would, you know, if I look at our environment, there are things that are shorter term, where the deliverable is a little bit easier to elucidate or and articulate. And there are some things where you go in knowing you're saying this is a very high risk area or it's going to take a long time, but we want to keep on working at the problem because it's important enough that if we can solve it, it's going to open up an area of space that's very important for us. But then it's also the question on who, who is paying for the, um, I mean, the invention, fine, but the innovation, who is paying for that? And then, of course, for a company, many times you are stuck in uh, the owner's view. You don't, if you have a, if the leadership of the company is really, could be really long term and, and have patience and, and everything. But uh, then you have to really make sure that you're not locked in by, by the owners. Or if you are, if you're using, a, uh, starting up your own company, if you're using the wrong money in the wrong way, then you really get, I see that all the time, that, uh, that money can be really hurting so the innovation. So you put your finger on something which we haven't mentioned, which is really Sorry, important, and that is leadership. Yeah. I mean, one of the key features of a successful innovative environment has got to be having a leader who yeah. has the vision yeah. and supports the idea. Mm. But just to concentrate on this difference between the timeline of innovative science and the application of innovative science, if you like. I mean, this morning, this morning Roger gave a lecture at Vandenberg Center called The End of Disease. It's a nice title. And unfortunately, there isn't time to give a potted version of it now. But you did, you did emphasize the importance of a deep understanding of biology for the realization of applied benefit. And one question is that if you, have an in, if you can construct an environment which supports the kind of fundamental long-term risk-taking thought that goes into develop to, to this, the, 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 the fundamental discoveries, then is it necessarily the case that you can have on top of that a mechanism that will be ready to pluck out the application but can survive for long enough to wait for the application? What do you think? Yeah, I think we'll, so a couple of points. The first one is... If I think about the culture we're trying to create, it's not one where we pick up nature and science and try and copy an experiment. It's one where we want to try and be in the lab at the same time as you know, when those discoveries are being made, working with the right people at the coal face, making those discoveries so that we're confident in the data. Because I'm sure, you know, as you all know, that one of the you know, real problems we have right now in our industry and in, in, in the biomedical world is the irreproducibility of high impact papers, which can lead to many wild goose chases. So I think that one of the best ways of avoiding that is actually being at the coalface yourself and being familiar enough and expert enough in the basic biology and the ba fundamental understanding of disease process that you're kind of creating the science along with your, the, the, the collaborators and 
the community that's working in that space. Mm. So if all you're doing is taking something and then trying to apply it to drug discovery, I think you're, you're doomed to failure. Um, if you're understanding your disease processes and the pathophysiology and the mechanisms of the biology you're trying to target well, then I think you're much more likely to actually generate successful drug discovery programs and also do better science as a consequence. It's, it's a rest- I mean, obviously it's a restriction, but you often, and f- one of the critical things about an innovative environment is, is ex- complete freedom of information flow between different partners. And that's a, that's a constraint that you have because you also have to protect intellectual property. So we'll, do, we'll do a little experiment. How many people in this room have to publish a paper? <laughs> um, so it's, it's one, one of our, the only way we can, be, we can compete scientifically, if we're, it's not only if we're porous, but if we make our science accessible to people. Mm. Obviously there are going to be certain things like the end stage chemical matter, which is for a particular proprietary, which is be the, the compound that goes to the clinic, where you need to protect, you make, need to make sure you file the appropriate patent protection and then are, are careful about how you disclose that. But pretty much everything else, you know what, I think we can share most of the things that we work in. And I think historically, if you'd asked that, que- if you'd asked that question probably five, ten years ago, you know, we, we, the industry used to hide behind this mm-hmm. fear of, I work in a company, I can't share anything. And it's actually got quite tiring going to you know, very good organisa- you know, academic groups and saying, well, you know, industry has sucked us dry and hasn't given anything back. That, that's not how we work. That's not how AstraZeneca works. We want to be contributing the scientific conversation to understanding fundamental problems and helping ourselves and the academic groups turn that understanding into something that can be applied to, to become a medicine. I think it's critically important. That's why we're moving to Cambridge. That's why I think we're trying to network so much with Karolinska and the universities in, in, uh, in Sweden, and that's what we're trying to do in the US as well. And the more porous we can make ourselves, the better I think we'll become at drug discovery. No, you made a very, very good point, which uh, I haven't heard made before. Uh, but it's so true that uh, very often companies have the idea and many have scouts and they think they can go to academic laboratories and cherry pick, find good things and license them or what have you. But really the only way that can be accomplished uh, in a reliable fashion and done wisely is by the manner that you've now explained, which is by being a participant in the discovery, by being part of the field and then you're attuned to it and you recognize these things, you can evaluate them uh, and uh, you can make both the right choices and do it at the right time. I think it's very wise. And then you also, the word that hasn't come forward yet is trust, right? Yes. There has to be that Absolutely. from all sides. Absolutely. Adult, adult conversations. <laughs> and by being a partner rather than a poacher, yes. uh, you engender trust. Uh, I think uh, I think also that there is something more in in this here as, um, that um, could be of interest is that uh, we see often we see companies of course not AstraZeneca but others that are um, <laughs> that are kind of sure on what they want to do next and uh, very sure and and they more or less uh, to, you know say that okay you pr- provide us with good students that have good knowledge but we will provide them with how they should think because we know that and so forth. Um, and, and this is, of course, not uh, only companies that are locked into. We can see what happens, you know, like Hasselblad and all. What happens if you if you think you know the next step, uh, or if you think you're best? Uh, but we also we also see that that can happen also in the academic environment. I uh, once I, I was uh, in a in a university where um, bio, uh, biochemistry department was very strong and uh, and what you could see over some years it, it just disappeared and the reason now he's laughing yeah I think uh, I recognize this yes. one <laughs> <laughs> we have similar experiences um, uh, no, but the reason I think it's kind of it, you we need to think about this because the reason there was that science around had really developed so much and but they thought that they were as the ones that knew this best. Yes. They knew the techniques should be used, they knew what, how to think, they knew, but of course in, in biochemistry, 
I mean, you, you, have to, you have to make a completely new business plan, even in academia, uh, in order to, be, to really step up to the next level. And I think that is how can we make sure we are not really um, blind? Um, how, do you, how do you see that? Is, is uh, BioX the solution? <laughs> BioX at Stanford is uh, something which has a very uh, complex history. So. It actually arose out of my going to the provost of the university uh, to make the case for expanding structural biology at Stanford. And then uh, Steve Chu, who is a physicist, won the Nobel Prize. And so he got the year of the provost. And he said, well, instead, you should do what I want to do. <laughs> and naturally, the provost listened to Steve. Uh, now, uh, Steve was a good friend, would not mind my saying uh, that uh, he knows more physics than he does biology. Uh, and uh, BioX was created because the X could be anything, because he didn't know what it ought to be. <laughs> uh, and so BioX is an agglomeration. It's a collection of a motley crew from bioengineering, from the School of Medicine, from physics, and so on and so forth. And you know, if I were to be senatorial or polite about it, I would say the jury is out regarding the success of that enterprise. If you want to know my real opinion, I'll tell you later. <laughs> but, uh, the, so, but the straight answer is, no, I don't think you, I actually don't think that you can, uh, as it were, uh, create interdisciplinary research by placing people next to each other. Mm. I think you have to make the opportunities, the, the opportunities are available and it depends on the individuals yeah. to take yes. that interest. The individuals yeah. have to want to do it. It has to be something they are motivated. It can be easier take. or more difficult to happen. So obviously proximity can help. And you but can, they're going to do it if they're enabled. Absolutely, they're going to do it if absolutely. it's hard, and they may not do it if it's easy. That's absolutely right. Yeah. yeah. Marvelous point to take a break and look look to the audience and see whether there are any comments or questions. Does anybody want to say anything? Mm. Obvi obviously. Here we have a question. Uh, there are microphones behind you, so if you could just make sure it's on. Has no one else said anything? I'll ask a question. <laughs> <laughs> so do you think innovation happens generally by committees or by mavericks? And how does the answer to that first question influence the environment you should generate in a company? Who wants to looking at me, but looking he's asking you. So you, <laughs> <laughs> you answer it first. So I, so, so I think it happened. I don't think you can prescribe it happening, but it can happen lots of different ways. I don't think I think it can happen in teams. It can be driven by individuals, it can be driven by mavericks, it can be driven by people, uh, I think it's driven by truth seekers. And I think that can take many shapes or forms. Um, and I think saying it's just this or just this or just that, I think is, it would be just a, I think would, would be inaccurate. I think it can happen in many different ways. I think the key is that you create an environment where it's actually okay to innovate and where you encourage it and where the people have the freedom to actually pursue you know, that innovation. I think what we might come back to is this idea about leadership. Uh, I mean, someone sets a tone. Yeah. It can be in a family, it can be in a laboratory, it can be in a company. But someone sets the tone. And that tone can be uh, one that leaves people free or makes them feel like they have the opportunity uh, to roam intellectually, experimentally, or what have you. Uh, and if that is done, then it will happen. Another important driver for innovation, I think, in an individual is, uh, we see that in the students now, very interesting, more of a value ground uh, questioning. They, they really ask what, uh, what kind of values do you have uh, when they go to an interview for a job, which is surprising for the, for the company that's asking them to join. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that that is something that we should, but maybe this is part of the, the globalization of the world that the young people start to think. And that could be a really good driver, I think, for, for really take um, uh, the extra step and, and, um, and really go beyond and, and really become a changing agent in the company that you, you start to work and, and, and also uh, really use the connections that you have from the university you studied. We see much more now that the students are 
asking, um, we want to know who is the teacher of the class and what is really the content of the class. But we also want to know what is the teacher doing in the research lab mm. so that we can, uh, we can have that connection and understanding. Uh, I think I haven't heard that before, so I think this is a positive. What, what do you think about that? What should we do? How should we foster this so it will? Look, I think uh, that the best people to convey knowledge are those who are in the process of acquiring new knowledge because uh, there's a spirit that goes with it. Uh, and it is along the lines of what you were saying a moment ago that uh, the best people to judge and decide on what opportunity uh, to, to uh, seize are those who are there at the time. And in the same way, the best people to convey knowledge, as I say, are those who are interested in the acquisition of new knowledge. And that is what you might interpret from the attitude of the students that you expressed. Mm -hmm. can, I ask, can I ask just a related question? I was at a, at a meeting with um, the graduate students last week in Cambridge. And one of the themes that came up was the, the, the changing world in terms of how the you know students of today you know their their interests their ability to stay on one topic for a period of time um, you know we used to have jobs for life we used to have you know we have people that have worked on a discipline or an area for many years and the tendency now I think is to you know is to kind of jump into things and then jump into something else and I wonder how that if that is true. How do you think that will ultimately impact the way research is done and how people then actually create their careers and make the next innovation? You know, you know, you've been spending decades of your life doing what you do. Do you see that happening with a generation of science that's being taught and educated today? Look, I think uh, mobility can be beneficial. Yeah. Sometimes one of the people will be stimulated to think of new things or to change what they do by changing their location, changing their setting. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily a bad thing. Um, it can, as your question implies, also interfere. Yeah. So it can cut, that could cut both ways. Um, I don't know what is the mobility in industry. Do people move a lot more than in an academic world? Um, I think we, 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 it's pretty mobile, yeah. Uh, again, it depends. It, it, it's around certain hot spots where there's more mobility than other areas. Obviously, if you're in California or Boston, there's a lot more mobility than, than you know if you're in the northwest of the UK. But there is mobility generally. I would say that across the industry. Does Sweden move around from university like they university like they do in America? Um, Not much. No. Not much. Uh, no, but uh, in, you know, relative. I think Gothenburg is in a good situation in Sweden, but uh, terrible in the world. <laughs> I think that I, wanted, I would like the word maverick because I've been part of the Lozac legend at AstraZeneca is, I don't know how much truth there is in it, but it's certainly, the way I heard about it, it was a little bit of a, a battle of mavericks not having a project shut down. And I, I wonder how in the, in the industrial career and in, also in the academic career, how does one uh, recognise and, and, and support not support the mavericks, not necessarily, you can't support all the mavericks because then there's chaos. Yes. <laughs> but yeah. there so is a need for people prepared to stand up for crazy things as well. I mean, I think exa example, I mean, you know, we have a, a, a very good example of a molecule called the Laparib, which is, you know, being filed in, in the US and Europe for, uh, for BRCA positive ovarian cancer and breast cancer. That project was terminated a year and a half ago. Um, and was continued, I, I wouldn't say by mavericks, but by people that fundamentally believed that this was going to be a valuable medicine and make a difference to patients. Mm. And we continued many of the experiments and, and the programs despite being told that it was to be written off. Is that, I, I wouldn't call that a maverick, I'd call that actually you know, taking a smart... Re no, but I think it's, it's, it's kind of, cause we kind of, we, we call these, you know, people that are passionate about something and, and continue to believe in something. I think if you do that with, um, with some rationale, with a hypothesis behind it, with a, a truth to seek, with a killer question that you can answer, it's great. I think that the bit that I think I'm not so keen on is procrastination, where, you, where, where actually the, you know, the, the truth is probably that something doesn't work, but we keep on doing an incremental experiment 
Well, that's a to, different, that's to, a difficult but thing. But it's, it's quite difficult thing to dissociate, though, right? Because they could both be, you know, they both might think they're mavericks, and one I would say would give me more of, and one I would say, actually, I'd rather get to the killer question straight away. Yeah. So it's a very, very, I think it's actually, by definition, a maverick is different, is difficult to manage, lead, because that, otherwise they wouldn't be, if they were easy, it wouldn't be a maverick. Mm. <laughs> Right, so I don't, I don't think there's a, I, I don't, I, I don't know how you. What I want to do is create, create an environment where there's enough freedom for people to be able to express themselves scientifically. That I think is the key. Um, whether, whether that, that I, I, I don't know how you, how you measure, how you increase the level of maverickdom in an organisation. Um, and what the, people, people what, in it, I mean, some people have a character which makes them a little bit prickly. rebellious. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. We have plenty of those. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Comes back again to the judgment of the leaders. Yeah. And that's critical. And we know a good leader when we see one, yeah. and it's manifest in the results. You know, you look yeah. at a Roy Vagelos at Merck, was really a legendary Absolutely. leader. He's one of my heroes. But, uh, you know, it reminds me of email that I've been exchanging for the last couple of weeks with a fellow who has very good credentials. He's an elderly scientist, but has had a very distinguished career, who believes DNA is not a double helix. <laughs> and wants me to do the experiment that he's designed <laughs> to finally set the record straight. And I've been trying politely to tell him that, you know, I'm not going to make my career that way. I don't want to get famous for showing <laughs> DNA is not a double helix. Leave me alone. Yeah. While it's still going on, I can't tell you how the story will end. But there's an example of a maverick who, if I were a leader, I would gently set aside. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Please. Yes, Dr. Korn Kornberg, is there any Nobel Prize that has inspired you more than others for any reason? And, and secondly, would you have conducted your research in a different manner had there not been such a thing as the Nobel Prize? So I can easily answer the second question, uh, which is uh, absolutely for sure not. However, uh, that isn't always the right answer. So for example, Paul Nurse will tell you that he decided to study the cell cycle because he thought there was a Nobel Prize in it. <laughs> now, it's not entirely fair to Paul, uh, even though he said that, and that's uh, what he would tell you if you asked him. Uh, he did brilliant work regardless. Uh, and not everyone who thought there was a Nobel Prize in the cell cycle went on to succeed in that way. Um, but uh, I, I do think that if you adhere to some of what has been discussed here, you uh, take risks, you try to solve large questions, you undertake uh, what are bold ventures in science, and you succeed, you may well gain such recognition. And even if you don't, it doesn't matter, because you will be similarly regarded by your peers. I mean, everyone, you will enjoy that very same level of respect. As I often point out, there are at least 100 scientists out there um, who I regard as, who are my heroes and I regard as great for every one amongst them who happen to win the prize. I mean, it's not the fault of the prize-giving body. They can't give them to everyone. Uh, but at the same time, there really are that many great scientists, and there isn't a distinction um, uh, that can be made uh, at the level of the caliber of science or the stature of the individuals. Coming back to your first question, uh, I was fortunate to have around me people who uh, were great scientists and did win the prize. So I worked with my father as a child, then I worked with Paul Berg, then I was uh, associated with Francis Crick and with Aaron Klug as a postdoctoral fellow. The person who was mostly around the lab when I was a graduate student in chemistry was Linus Pauling, uh, who used to tell me all kinds of interesting things, some of which were right and some of which probably not. Um, and so I don't think I can give a fair answer to that question because I was unduly exposed <laughs> to such influence. And every one of those people was a formative influence. Uh, but there's no doubt 
uh, that I benefited. Did, did your father, a Nobel laureate, ever mention to you the idea that you might get the prize? Only when it was imminent. So it wasn't, uh, wasn't held it, up as a beacon? It was exactly the opposite. <laughs> uh, exactly the opposite. So for one thing, it was something that I re don't even recall being very aware of, except when it happened, but for many years after, no. Uh, and even when it happened, and this may amuse you, I thought it was a mistake. When my father won the prize, I was sure that they got it wrong. Why? Because he uh, used to tell my brothers and me when we were children, uh, when Conrad Block would visit, or Theodore Lenin, or others who we knew well, uh, Conrad or Theodore, they're great scientists. And so we would ask our father, as any child would do, are you a great scientist? And he would always tell us, no, I'm an ordinary scientist. Uh, I didn't appreciate until, until years later that that was very deliberate. Mm -hmm. he, he didn't think he was an ordinary scientist. But he wanted us to believe that so that we would be in no way intimidated. And we would therefore feel that anything was possible for us. And by the time I realized that he was truly a great scientist, I was in my 20s, and it was too late to do any damage. <laughs> <laughs> but there's, there's, again, there's the kernel of something there, because that's, I mean, talking about creating an innovative environment, giving you the confidence to think that you can succeed and not be intimidated out of it, that seems to be an essential part of any culture that is going to... And that was innovation. the whole point with him. It was that, you know, he believed that... He used to say that, you know, children are capable of anything, you just don't want to screw them up. Uh, don't get in the way of the development. What he, in this respect, what he meant was, you know, allow them to be independent and to believe that anything is possible for them. And, uh, and if they make it to adulthood thinking that, then, it w then you will have succeeded in your role, your job of parenting. How many of your children are scientists? Uh, one of my, my eldest is a scientist, and the next one is going to be a social scientist. She wants to save the world. <laughs> um, uh, I'm wondering because uh, the influence from from uh, parents and so forth is interesting. But now we have also very strong influence from the computerized world. So in that goes, I think maybe in two directions because uh, as, as uh, because of that we don't have to have so uh, so really good memory because the memory is always there. Uh, we could, uh, but we have to be able to really find what we want, so we have to understand and handle the complexity and so forth. And then, but in the other hand, the computer is training part of the brain that is really, has a fast reward, which is probably not uh, really optimal for analytical thinking and, and developing the creativity. So how do you, well, these two kind of goes cross each other, but are you thinking about that? And do you think that that, what, what do we have to, what we have to do, is that something we, sh we should just let go, or should we be concerned about this in any way? You know, it, I've often thought with that, as in many other examples that I could give you, uh, there are trends or movements or changes we cannot fight, <laughs> and so we just have to adapt. But uh, we, we have to make choices in the university, in the uh, pedagogic environment. Um, so now are, we are benchmarking with Stanford. Is that a good idea? So there are these great ways. <laughs> there are these great ways to exploit uh, the power of computers for learning and teaching. And you know about them. I, I'm, I hesitate to say this because I'm sure you know so much better than I. Uh, but I, I see examples of it. So, for example, new ways of teaching physics by producing these wonderful videos that illustrate all of the different principles. Uh, and so you don't have to try to imagine them anymore. You can see them and then you can actually interact with them and change the variables and what have you. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, I'm very sympathetic to what you say about the way in which it affects uh, people's patience and their penchant for deep thought. Um, mm -hmm. I think it is a pity that uh, it can tend to uh, <coughs> cut short the kind of contemplation mm -hmm. that is required. I don't know a solution to that problem. Probably mix. I think we're stuck with that. Uh, well, my group, we work extremely internationally. So this 
technology is just fantastic. The ability to exchange, organize things. If we have 60 people descending on an experiment in Stanford, for example, which we've done, then then this from different parts of the, from uh, the US, from, from Germany, from, from Sweden, then this information flow and how that works today just makes that possible. And um, so I'm all for it. I could talk a little bit about my experience working in Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's disease has always been quite a popular research area. It's always been well funded. Um, maybe not as well funded as, as oncology, but it, it was quite interesting that you could generally find whatever data you wanted to support your hypothesis if you yeah. looked hard enough, if you ignored everything else. And so to, to me, it's about, again, gets back to the basics of how well, how, how truth-seeking are you? How well do you understand the area that you're working in and the, in the, in the basic biology or pathophysiology? And can you distill that information to actually, you know, get the, the, the good nuggets of information and kind of ignore the, the distractions? Because I think the danger you have with having too much information is you go chasing too many rabbits down holes and actually don't focus on whatever the key question is that you're trying to answer. That's the danger. I think the great news is that if you want to learn about something, if you want to dip into an area and dip out because you think it might be useful, you can do that a lot more easily with the access that we have to various um, technologies and, and, and IT platforms than we were ever used to. Um, and also, obviously, it makes it much easier to collaborate with people because you can exchange data a lot more easily as well. I guess it also relates to the question, what is quality? I yeah. mean, nowadays, we've got a situation where there's enormous number of journals, <laughs> um, and they have an incentive, or many of them have an incentive to publish in order to be paid, and the authors have an incentive to publish in order to build up their record. So the, both have incentives pushing in the same direction, and, and what is quality? How do you extract quality um, from, from, from such a large volume of information? Does that give you a negative? To I think that's really a very, that's a very important point. Yeah. I mean, if, if I, I was having trouble thinking of something to add to this question of what may be the downside, but that's a terribly important point, that with that uh, explosive growth in volume, absolutely comes a loss of the kind of care and refinement, mm. which makes a big difference and which is an essential aspect of innovation along the lines of what I mentioned earlier, the need for criticism. Yeah. I mean, the need for really serious uh, evaluation of ideas. I also think it's, uh, it is very important to think that um, if we don't handle this right, it could be, uh, society could be driven by ignorance. And of course, that um, um, the, the customers out there, uh, if we really are going to make changes that comes from the understanding of um, whatever personal medicine or new chemicals uh, to be used, graphene uh, scares some people, but could be really a, an opening. Uh, all these things that we, are, we have in our hands today, they could be innovations. Uh, if, the, if the customer is not dear to, uh, to uh, ask for it, um, we will not see any, any production in, in companies in it because we, have, we don't have connection with the production part so much. We have with the scientific part of the companies and only has to be, uh, I think that is, um, it is a challenge that uh, to really that suddenly we at the university and students and researchers are responsible to have the whole, the whole society to really uh, um, be um, aware and, and, and ask for these things to come in play. Um, this, I think, is a, it's a big difference. And yeah. also, we, we used to say that this is open innovation. So open innovation is a very important driving force, very much uh, was around in, this, in the Silicon Valley. And, but what is happening now, when, uh, when we have these tools are built into companies, uh, like MOOC, like uh, different type of of uh, tools that we have for knowledge transfer, transfer. If that comes into companies and we lose control over that, we have to, um, we have to compete with, the, with our communication tools. And our, uh, I think this could, really, this could really be a problem for the openness that we have, are trying to achieve. What do you think about that? Openness is a danger. Openness is in danger, and if ignorance is, uh, is the, uh, 
is the customer, uh, <laughs> we have a little problem for innovation. Look, I mean, as you said earlier, I mean, openness is uh, key. But uh, the other thing I was going to remark, I mean, it's wonderful having this ready access to information, but it's not always all that useful. You know, I was, uh, the other day, I, I, I been for quite some time, I wanted to understand how does a memory stick work? And how does this little inanimate bit of material store all that information, and how is it so accessible? And uh, so first I went to the internet, I couldn't find out to save my life. In fact, you, I don't know if you can. <laughs> then I went to uh, my colleague, Michael Levitt, who works down the hall from me and is one of my closest friends. And Michael's a great computer scientist, but he couldn't explain it to me either. And I'm still waiting for someone to tell me. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody? <laughs> <laughs> Question here. Is that better now? Yeah. So I was just reflecting a little bit on what you were saying. There are vast amount of information. And how do we judge whether that information is relevant or not relevant? And I would like to reflect a little bit, uh, going back to my 15-year-old, which is actually learning mm -hmm. at school how to go about, do some research on the internet, and understand why that is relevant or not. That comes back to what you said. You have the students and come and ask you, who is the teacher? What is he teaching? What is his research about? Why is he doing what he's doing? So I think that's the way to deal with the vast amount of information, understanding who is the person providing the information? What are they doing? What are they standing for? And I think that's what we need to do instead of just, you know, of course there are issues and it's very important to, to think about that. But just try to bring them somehow in this judgment, which maybe brings us back to even older times. It's not that an expert said it, but just try to find out and identify for ourselves, is that relevant or not? So that's what I want to add. That's a very interesting point. And in the last five minutes, I wonder whether we might come to the question, jumping off that question, of what are the most difficult things to recreate or to get hold of in the creation of an innovative environment? Because everybody's out there trying to make innovative environments in every sphere. But what's the, what's the key bit of capital you have to get hold of in order to succeed? And maybe it's access to the right sort of information. No, maybe it's other things. I think it's time, actually. In fact, if I, if I, if I think if I was to ask at least in our organisation, why do people find it difficult or, or what gets in the way of the freedom to innovate, I think it'll be the pressure of time and delivering near-term versus long-term goals. Um, and I think, you know, we have various, you know, I can give, talk about Martin and his crazy banana club that you started, which is actually, you know, creating an environment where people go and do something that actually was off drug discovery, um, but aimed at answering a biological or scientific question. Um, you know, or our postdoc program, which is really aimed at basic research. So I think creating an environment where you give people time, where somehow, and also where they take accountability for it, and it's okay to own some of your time to do something that's a little bit more basic or a little bit more fundamental, or you tag it onto something you're doing that's short term. I remember, if I had to take the analogy, of how I, used to, I used to add lanes on my experiments. I used to always have a side project going that would be run at the same time as kind of my, you know, my, my near-term goals. So I think people have to find ways of creating that time and prioritizing that time. And if innovating is high enough on their priority list, they'll find time. If it's not, it kind of falls down the pecking order and, and, and it gets taken over by other things. And I think that actually, for me, is, is, is the most important, is recruiting and having people in an organization where actually innovating is high enough on their priority list that they actually find the time, they, they make the time to do it. So it's both time and finding the and yeah. people. Yeah. OK. OK. Um, yeah, I would comment on this conflict between leadership and freedom that you have in all environments, that strong leadership, I think, is essential. If you don't have, if you don't have good leadership, then most activities are not going to be successful in the long run. But the leadership has to, there also has to be freedom. The individuals have to feel ownership of what they're doing, they have to buy in, but they also have to feel trusted that if they step out of what framework their leader gives them, that, that they have 
freedom within limits, perhaps, to, to do that and to try and to, to achieve. And this is, this, is, this is a conflict, and if that balance is working right, given the personalities, then environments can be very creative. And even if you've got very creative people and that balance doesn't work properly, then it can run into a wall. And, um, and that's, that's a challenge. Mm -hmm. Karen? Well, I would, if you, why don't you go ahead, Karen? And yes, I, um, I would I like to add um, tradition. It's a really um, uh, a problem, a challenge. Um, because we, we talk, it's so easy to talk about change. Everybody wants to talk about change. Soon as they see that it's coming, um, the tradition kicks in. And everybody uh, really, you have to go through, everybody knows you have to go through a really difficult phase there. And, and to go through that phase, I think we, we need to really um, um, build in uh, some kind of dependence in the system, if, if it's possible. Or do like Dan Schechtman, Danny Schechtman. He, he's really an, uh, changed the traditional Israel. Mm -hmm. Um, to, he was very much a part of that, of course. And, um, and he, what he said um, is, is really interesting because he, he said that he, is, he started out some courses to really uh, put the information forward on what you need to have, the skills you need to have. But the tradition was kicking in. He said, we don't have any exams in this course, no exams. But you have to be, and you have to be inspired, you have to come to the lectures, you have to get in contact with the teachers. And in that way, he could build in that dependence to, to change. And, it, and of course, they have really been so successful. So I think that's hope for me. Okay. Change in tradition. I would just add a brief remark to what Richard said already. Um, so he commented on the need for a balance between leadership and the freedom of the individual. Uh, and I think that's the mark of a successful leader. Uh, the, uh, he uh, gives people the feeling that they are uh, and free or encouraged or won't be punished for trying things on their own, uh, that they have the time, as you've said, uh, perhaps so they're not bound to my tradition. I think at the end of the day, uh, it's going to be the leader that determines whether or not uh, a particular setting, environment, what have you, is conducive to innovation. And maybe that's the word, conducive. Maybe you can't create an innovative environment. All you, environment, all you can create is an environment that is conducive. Indeed. <laughs> maybe that's the point to stop. <laughs> <laughs> I guess we're out of time. But, um, we've covered a little bit of the topic, and it's been absolutely fascinating. Thank you all very much indeed. I'd like to thank you all for being here and taking the trouble to have this conversation, and also I'd like to thank the audience for taking the time to be part of the conversation. Thank you all very much indeed.